Hello, friends. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. My name is Michael Woods. I'm the Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. In today's episode, I'm going to discuss some of the most popular topics from the ATC website in 2023. How do I know these are the most popular topics? How do I know these are what people were interested in? Well, I wrote a number of blog posts last year and I can check the Google Analytics and find out how many times each page was viewed. So what I did is took this into a blog post. I looked at how many page views each of these blog posts that I posted in 2023, how many page views each of those got. And I put it in a post called the top 10 posts of 2023. I'm going to not talk for too long about this. I don't intend this to be a particularly long episode, but I wanted to share this and discuss some of these topics again because they're the ones that I know people are interested in. So this is a post, the title is the top 10 posts of 2023, and I'm going to put a direct link to this in the show notes so that you can check this out and go to see each one of these if you're interested, or more likely you'll be interested in a couple of them. So they're on a range of topics. Uh, I, I noted at the start, I said they are on a nice balance of topics. Three, about growth rate and nitrogen. Four, about soil organic matter and surface hardness and top dressing. One, about soil pH. And one, about soil water content and evapotranspiration. Now, it's pretty typical on my blog posts uh, for the most popular ones to be on sort of technical topics. So if I write about uh, my favorite golf course on a tropical island or or, uh, a book that I read that talks about golf courses back 50 years ago or something, those type of topics usually don't get a, a huge number of views. But what does get a lot of views are these ones on specific topics about nitrogen and growth rate and soil organic matter and sand top dressing and soil pH and that sort of thing. Number one was a post that I wrote in May. It's got a title, Reflections on Growth Rate, Nitrogen and Top Dressing. And in that one, I gave a list of things that have caused me to change my mind or to think differently about growth rate and how much nitrogen is required and how much sand top dressing is required. I used to go very much by the textbook and just think that it's common for a certain grass to have a certain amount of nitrogen that it requires. But now I say, let's look at the grass. Let's check if the grass is already growing enough. If the grass is already growing enough, then we don't need to apply as much nitrogen. So instead of doing things on a calendar schedule, I would say, let's do it based on how the grass is performing. And the same thing goes for top dressing. If the grass is not growing, it doesn't require sand top dressing, rather obviously, I would think. But I used to think more that there's a top dressing requirement. But now I think that grass that grows half as much is going to require half as much sand. So uh, I'm quite interested in that. And I think it's a useful way to think about turf grass management. And I talked in that post or I wrote in that post about how I came to think this way and some of the things that have influenced me. And that includes seeing excellent turf grass surfaces all around the world that are produced with less nitrogen than I thought was standard. And also thinking and rethinking about Claude Crockford's statement when he famously said that the big difference between greenkeeping in Australia and greenkeeping in the United States would be that Australian greenkeepers are always trying to prevent the grass from growing, I I paraphrase here, and that American greenkeepers are trying to make the grass grow. And 
you know, a long, long time ago, I would have thought, well, of course, American greenkeepers have to make the grass grow because America has such an extreme climate that if you're in Virginia, for example, or if you're in North Carolina or you're in Texas, and if you don't force the grass to grow, then you're not going to have a golfing surface. And, and so I just kind of took it for granted that because of America's climate, we we have to force the grass to grow and then we use all the tools, the equipment that we have to mow it and verticut it and create a surface. But now I think there, there's a better way to do it and that's to think about the growth rate first and think, how can we grow the grass just enough at this location? So of course you have to force grass to grow in Virginia somewhat, but I think... Uh, my default had been in the past to make the grass grow a little bit too much. And so that was one that I really enjoyed writing. And if you haven't read it yet, I would encourage you to check that out. And be, uh, I'll also mention here that all of the back, uh, the, the, the catalog of ATC Double Cut podcasts are, is going to, to contain that catalog is going to contain some episodes in which I've discussed each of these blog posts specifically. So if you're really interested in this and you'd like to hear about it, go check out the back catalog of the ATC Double Cup podcast. The second most viewed post was the growth ratio equation. And this is the equation, the simple formula for evaluating actual growth compared with expected growth. And I've mentioned before that it took me a long time to figure out the growth ratio equation, why it's so practical. Because growth potential is very theoretical. Growth potential is just saying the grass may grow like this given a certain temperature. So obviously if the grass is growing in zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If the ground is frozen, the grass is not going to grow. And if the temperature is 75 Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius or something like that, that's kind of nice growing conditions for a lot of grasses, then the grass will have a higher growth potential. Um, but it's, but it's theoretical. Um, it, it, it's not exactly how the grass is growing. It's just whether the grass can grow or whether it, it, absolutely cannot grow. So growth potential on its own, I quite like it. It's very useful, but I didn't really understand how linking that with the actual growth in what's called the growth ratio, I didn't really understand how practical that could be and how useful that could be. And it turns out it's really useful. And all you have to do is express it in a very simple equation form. You take your actual growth, which I like to measure this very easily with clipping volume. So you take the actual growth, how much the grass is growing, and you put that in the numerator of, of this ratio. And then in the denominator, you put the growth potential multiplied by a standard amount of clippings. And if we're doing this on a daily basis, then I recommend uh, the standard value should be 20 milliliters of clippings per square meter. So you multiply that times the growth potential and that, that simple thing is the growth ratio. And then it's like, well, what, what does this equation do? Well, what it does is by expressing the actual growth in that form and bringing growth potential into it, it's now telling us how the grass is growing compared to how we would expect it to grow given the recent weather conditions. So imagine if you're getting a lot of growth, but the temperature is zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the expected growth would be zero. But if, if you're getting a lot of growth then, and your expected growth is zero, that would be really unusual. And likewise, if you're getting almost no growth, but the temperatures are almost perfect and for, for the grass to grow and you'd be expected to get a lot of growth, the growth potential will flag those kind of anomalies. But the main idea is if this, is sta if this stays consistent through the year, that seems like a very reasonable way to manage. 
to grow the grass at an amount that is proportional, basically, to how much it's expected to grow. So I wrote out that equation in April. And one of the nice things about the ATC website, uh, for example, uh, if, if we bring up this growth ratio equation um, blog post, you'll see the tags right at the top. Um, so if you're listening to this, I'll describe it. There is a title of the blog post, which is the growth ratio equation. And then this has tags. One of the tags is growth ratio. One is clipping volume and one is growth potential. And if you would click on any of those tags, it'll bring up other blog posts that have that same tag. So this is kind of what the, uh, the hyperlinks are all about in, in the internet. So growth ratio brings up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven posts with the tag growth ratio. So I, I think it's really interesting to find out more about these things and the way that the website is set up, the ATC website, you can easily find, excuse me, you can easily find those through tags. The third most popular post of the year has a title, this is a soil pH chart that I do like. And it explains the one that I don't like, which is one that you'll often find in textbooks. And it shares one that I do, which is uh, from Golf Course Management Magazine uh, in an article by Bob Caro that I stumbled across uh, as I was uh, doing some research. And I was like, whoa, here's a, a soil pH chart that makes sense to me. This one I do like, and it is much better than the one that I don't like. And so I think it's useful to check that out. And, and in fact, you'll see uh, Travis Shaddix on his Turfgrass Epistemology YouTube channel uh, and, and podcast. He's been talking, he's got a couple recent episodes about uh, that particular soil pH chart. Um, and, and basically, it's a very pretty chart. And it's, and it's kind of nice to realize that soil pH does have an effect on solubility of nutrients, but that's not really, it's not useful in terms of how we should decide what fertilizer to apply. Uh, and, it, and it has the potential to be misleading, and it's not really telling us anything that's actionable. Whereas the chart from Dr. Caro and the one that I highlighted in that post, it does tell us things that are um, more actionable. And so that, that's something that I would encourage you to check out if you haven't seen it yet. Number four, and now we get into organic matter. Uh, in, in past years, I think some of the coring, top dressing, and organic matter posts uh, were number one. And I was glad that in 2023, it took us down to number four on the list before we find that. And that is how much organic matter is too much as a question. And this is something that answers a question that I actually would rather not answer. But I did provide an answer in that blog post. And I also gave a suggestion about how I recommend thinking about it. So instead of just giving a straightforward answer, I, I would rather that you actually think about this in a certain way. Now, I know that a lot of people have this question, how much organic matter is too much? In fact, I was giving a seminar in Nagano Prefecture in Japan in late September, and this question was asked me, how much organic matter is too much in the soil? And that's, uh, I, I made a note in my notebook, as I tend to do uh, when people ask an interesting question that I may want to elaborate on later, and I did elaborate on that in a blog post. And, and so what the answer is, is I just kind of gave an average. I said, on average, this is the amount of organic matter that we tend to see. And I think when we go into the, the upper amounts of that, so uh, I'm checking out this blog post. Uh, I, I'm saying when we would get into like the top 25%. Of, of all of the samples from a particular depth. So specifically, like if we're looking at soil organic matter, it's normal in a putting green to have soil organic matter in the top 10 centimeters or the top four inches. It's normal for that to be 
less than 1.6%. If you're greater than 1.6%, that means you're in the top 25%. And, and that just means, yeah, you're, you're, you're relatively high. And if we look at all species of grass and look at the OM246, if you look specifically at the top two centimeters, right at the surface, 9% is the number. And that, that's the number that puts you into the 75th percentile. And so for me, that is just something that's like a little bit of a flag of like, okay, you're, you're higher than a lot of other places. And does it mean it's too much? Mm, I mean, not necessarily. If the surfaces are performing well, then it's not too much. But it's just a, a, a number that you can kind of have an idea that if you're at 9% or above in the top two centimeters, that's, that's, uh, that's up there. And then in the top two inches, uh, I use the 6% number. And that is also something that puts you into the 75th percentile. But the, the way that I really recommend people think about this is how is your surface performance? Because if your surface performance is fine, then I don't want to chase numbers with soil organic material in the soil. So I don't really want to say it is too much because I have seen places with 11%, 12%, 15% total organic material in the top two centimeters, and those surfaces are great. And so it, it's site specific, but if you want numbers, and so that's how I answered in the seminar, I said, if you want numbers, here are some numbers that for me kind of flag a test result as being relatively high, but I don't really want to say it's too much. Then in January, this is kind of a sad one. I, I think for some people who are big fans of uh, Twitter rankings, uh, number five was my analysis of turfgrass industry Twitter accounts in 2022. That's a post that came out in January of 2023. And that was the last time that I was able to do the analysis of checking the number of tweets and the number of followers that people have and how much interaction there is with their tweets, how many times they were mentioned in turf Twitter and then doing a little ranking based on that to, to try to identify some of the most influential accounts. Now, with a change in the x.com API, I'm no longer able to access any of that type of information. And so I, I can't do that analysis anymore in, in exactly that same way. This is, uh, this is something that went from being free and easy to do that research to now there is a 5,000 US dollar per month tier that doesn't even allow me to do as much as what I could do back uh, a year ago. So uh, if I was paying $60,000 a year, I could get 1 million tweets per month and analyze them. But in the past, uh, in the turf grass industry, I was able to get like 1.5, 1.6 million tweets and do an analysis on those. Um, so actually the number of tweets sent by everybody in Turfgrass Twitter, as I call it, uh, is greater, or in the past it's been greater than what I could have access now for $60,000. So uh, that's basically why the Turf Twitter ranking is no longer happening for me, but uh, Greens Pro, uh, Paul Hurst <laughs> has released a couple of videos in which he's made his own rankings, which is very funny. Uh, back to nitrogen for number six, I, I asked the question, is two tenths of a pound of nitrogen a lot or a little? And two tenths of a pound of, a nitro of nitrogen is one gram of nitrogen per square meter or 10 grams of nitrogen, uh, sorry, 10 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And the question is, is that a lot or is it a little? I think that tends to be thought of as a little if you're making it in a single application. It's, it's, a, it's a small amount. Um, 
But as those get added together, and if you think about how much nitrogen, how, how much the grass can grow if you apply that much nitrogen, and then you think, if you think like, okay, this year we applied two-tenths of a pound of nitrogen too much, that, that's not really a big deal because you just mow a little bit extra, verticut a little bit extra, add a little bit more sand, right? Like two-tenths of a pound is not very much, you would think. If, if your annual rate is, is 1.9 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, and then, then you, you could have had the same conditions with 1.7 pounds, but you don't really think that like the difference from, from 1.7 to 1.9 is that big of a deal. But the, th- the thing that I wanted to point out is maybe the grass grows more from a small amount of nitrogen than we expect. And if that's the case, and then if we go year after year with these slight over applications, if you go five years adding zero, adding two tenths of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet too much, then after five years, that's a pound of nitrogen. And then you would think, well, we get a heck of a lot of growth from putting a pound of nitrogen. And so the idea is to be really precise with how much we apply and try to avoid over application. It's not that we don't need to apply nitrogen, but it's that maybe the grass grows more for each unit of nitrogen than we realize. And not just that it's growing above ground, it's growing below ground also. Number seven on the list is a post called Managing Firmness surface hardness of turf grass surfaces and it shares three items that go into detail about this topic one of those was my atc office hours episode with richard forsyth who is the director of courses at royal melbourne golf club in australia and when the topic of firm and fast greens comes up and especially firm playing surfaces, Royal Melbourne comes to mind. And so it's very interesting to talk with Richard about that and to find out things that might surprise you. If, you, if you're a new listener to this uh, show, and if, you, if you're not familiar, if you haven't heard that episode that I had with Richard Forsyth, perhaps you'd be surprised to find out that those really firm surfaces at Royal Melbourne are produced with one top dressing event per year, sometimes zero top dressing events per year. And then you think, wait a second, wait a second. I thought I thought putting sand is gonna make surfaces more firm and, and you know, frequent dusting is gonna make surfaces more firm. Well, it, it may or it may not, but there are exceptions to that And one of the most famous exceptions is Royal Melbourne, where sand top dressing is almost never done. Core aeration is almost never done. Some of the maintenance practices that we take for granted as as contributing to firm surfaces, they're almost never done. And if you think about things a little bit differently, it may give you some ideas of some cool tricks that you could use to get even better surfaces at whatever type of location, whatever type of turf grass you are managing. Number eight is from July. It's a post called Hourly Evapotranspiration, Soil Water Content, and Crop Coefficients. And I checked the soil water content, and then I checked what the hourly evapotranspiration was at that location, and I checked whether the grass was using water, whether the soil water content was changing as expected based on the ET. And I think it's useful to think of soil water content in this way, and it's useful to pay careful attention to the evapotranspiration. And I don't think you can really be too much of an expert about this. So this is a topic that I I kind of got into in July, and then I got really busy and didn't really follow up with that very much. But I think it's a a nice... um, a nice topic for me to continue working on and trying to explain this to people and, and maybe making some, uh, 
making some more explanations about hourly evapotranspiration, daily evapotranspiration, weekly evapotranspiration, and how that's related to how much irrigation is required and how that's related to how the soil water content may change. In number nine, number nine is from June. It is a post with this very tantalizing, tempting title. The title being, Coring three times a year is recommended when... dot dot dot. And it's recommended three times a year when what I would consider a lot of nitrogen is applied. And specifically, this was a research article that was published last year, and it was describing some research that was done about a decade ago. So I think the research was done in 2012 or 2013, something like that. And it was on bank grass in the American Southeast. And the nitrogen rate was something like seven pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year, 350 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And that goes back to my number one post, my, my blog post number one, the, the, the one that had the top spot on this list this year about how I've rethought my thinking about, I've rethought my ideas about how much nitrogen and sand top dressing are, are required. And I would have thought in that climate that you'd need about 18 uh, grams of nitrogen, about uh, three and a half pounds. I, I would have thought that three and a half pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet in that climate would be reasonable for bent grass in a year. That is about 180 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And now, I think you could do less, which would be something like 110 kilograms, something like that, maybe maybe two pounds. So I've almost cut in half what I think is, is necessary to produce good bank grass in that climate. And it was just kind of, it was kind of an interesting combination to see, okay, here's an article that's recommending that you core three times a year. And I'm... Plus, it was recommending to do weekly venting, uh, sorry, monthly venting through the summer, solitine aeration. And I'm like, man, that's a lot of holes. If you core aerify a bent grass putting green three times a year, and if you put solitines every month, that is a lot of disruption. That is a lot of days in the year. That's a lot of weeks in the year, and it's going to add up to more than a month in the year. I mean, that's a couple months in the year in which the greens are disrupted, significantly disrupted. And of course, all that work needs to be done because the research proves it. But that work needed to be done when you applied seven pounds of nitrogen. Let me, let me double check that number. Was it seven pounds? Wow, 6.8 pounds. Yeah, so I round up. 342 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. 34.2 grams of nitrogen per square meter. 6.8 pounds. So yeah, three, uh, sorry, uh, seven, seven pounds is, is the round number, the approximate number. If you, yeah, it grows a lot of grass. If you put that much nitrogen, there's a lot of grass grows. That produces a lot of organic material at the surface. If you don't do all that coring and don't do all that top dressing, you'll have a lot of thatch. But this goes back to the whole point of, do we need to be growing the grass that much? I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying we don't need to grow the grass at some rate to deal with traffic, but do we need to grow it that much? And, and I would think now, I, I don't think we need to grow it that much. So it's useful to look at the details of some of these projects and say, okay, Coring three times a year is recommended. <laughs> and then, then put the qualifier. Yeah, if you're going to put that much nitrogen, uh, then, then yeah. If you're going to grow that much grass, you probably need to core that much. But you back one of them off, maybe you can back the other one off too. And the result might be better grass conditions for more days in the year. And number 10, all of these posts were uh, 
got a, got a lot of views and and I think rightly so I have a very uh, great audience uh, a great readership who's really good at identifying some of the best most practical useful topics uh, and this one number 10 from July sand top dressing measurement by exact methods and that shows how to check and confirm exactly how much sand is being applied so those uh, those are the top 10 of the year. So we've got top dressing, coring, nitrogen rates, evapotranspiration, firmness of surfaces, and then some, some kind of thinking ones about how much growth we can expect from, from a certain amount of nitrogen. That twi turfgrass Twitter analysis, organic matter, pH, and the, the very interesting and, and kind of new thing, growth ratio. Growth ratio, of course, invented by Jason Haynes, who is now at uh, Cabot Lynx in Canada. So these are the top 10 posts of 2023. And I hope that you find these posts uh, interesting to review. I, I suppose regular listeners to this show will re regular listeners to the ATC double cut will already have uh, have read some of these or will already have watched a video or listened to me discuss it. And it's kind of fun, I think, to review those again. It, it's one of my favorite blog posts to put together at the end of the year. Together, of course, with the one, <laughs> um, I, I also like looking at the ones that nobody does read. Um, and But these, these that a lot of people read, they usually really are some of the best, most useful uh, blog posts. And, and the topics that are going to be useful, you know, maybe we can even refer to some of these two years, three years, four years down the road. So... Um, that is what I had to share today. I will say thank you for watching and for listening. I will sign off now for ATC from Bangkok. I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.